Okay, hello. Um, today um, uh, I'm with Ben Spatz, and uh, we're in different different places, obviously, because uh, Ben is in Huddersfield and I'm, I'm at home. And um, Ben is the author of a really influential 2015 book called What a Body Can Do. And I've been teaching I haven't been teaching this book. I've been using this book in my teaching. I've been using this book in my research. So, um, and I know that a lot of, of other people have been using this book because um, it's had a, a, a very, very wide um, impact, a very broad impact um, in all sorts of different disciplines. So um, we'll just, we're going to start from that and talk about Ben's ongoing work as well and stuff, stuff around body and image and technology and exercise and dance and movement and embodied research. And hello, Ben, how are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. yeah. Um, so were you expecting this book to be as influential, as, as important and influential as it has been? Were you expecting this stuff? No, not at all. I mean, and thank you for saying that. Um, I, I no, I've been quite amazed at, at how it's been taken up. I mean, I did, I did feel like, I mean, as I was writing it, I felt like I was writing something that was essential for me. Uh, and I did feel like I was coming from a particular kind of world and speaking to another world. And so I thought maybe this will be useful. Hopefully this can be useful. I mean, I know there's a lot of people who, um, are various kinds of practitioners who work in various kinds of long-term ways um, and who then arrive to academia and don't really, aren't really presented with tools that get at the substance of what they do. They're presented with a lot of tools that kind of work around it. But uh, So I, I, I was, I was, I mean, I was proposing it as a toolkit, like I hope this is useful. Um, yeah. It's been great that it's been useful. And it has been. I mean, so what we um, um, we both know Eric Burkhart, and he's a, a medieval historian, uh, and he researches like questions around what the what the body can do, what we can know about what bodies were doing, um, yeah. like in the Middle Ages and so on. And he said that before he read your book, he was struggling with like uh, you know old concept from Marcel Mauss, and um, and this just was a complete game changer. Um, did you, so you, you <laughs> it was it's really clear this, the great thing about it is that you can set the, you can set chapters of it as I have for my undergraduate students and they get really excited by it and really into it oh, wow. um, and I mean the, I think the the argument that I pulled out most for I pulled out lots of different arguments fr from different parts of your book when I've taught students but the idea that you propose the idea of technique as a sort of basic unit of, of analysis. So this is, I mean, it's not exactly a, a completely new idea, but you, you it's a really um, um, a refinement of the way that people think about the way that we can be influenced across cultures through media in different ways. So was, was, this, in, was this focus on technique? Um, was it is, is, is that would, would you say that's the core of the book for you? Yes, I think that is absolutely the core and there's this this um, I, uh, Yeah, that, there was this I don't know if it was a specific moment, but I had this This kind of period where because while I was writing that book I mean, the book was a that was a, a PhD thesis originally at, at CUNY in New York City um, and I was in a situation where I was doing this PhD and then separately I was working uh, on a kind of cultivating my own practice, which is a theater-based practice, but it's a it's a kind of theater that's been heavily influenced by martial arts, dance, yoga, um, all of these things. So it's not a typical kind of theater acting process, but it's a it's a work on the self. But because it comes from theater, um, it also includes possibly more work on association and a narrative and, and uh, personal association and, and stories and all those kinds of things. So I was developing that at the same time, but the worlds were very very separate. And um, I was always crossing back and forth between them, sometimes between different parts of the city, sometimes even in the same building, going from one to the other in this very kind of like, it, it felt right in some way because they're both part of me, but, but I was navigating this dichotomy, which really is, I mean, at an institutional level, it was 
the mind-body dichotomy. It was like your body goes over here, you're in the space, you're moving, you're singing, okay, done, over here, and we are living, as the president of, uh, of the institution said when we, were, when we joined, now you're in the life of the mind. And, and so that all goes away. So I was going back and forth constantly, and technique at some point kind of became this touchstone for me where I was saying, okay, wait, that this, this, this is working in both places somehow, because I know that when we're in the studio um, and I'm thinking about what we're doing, since we're not making shows in the normal way that you do in theater uh, and, and the other kinds of, we're not very focused on this kind of thing, we're, we're just practicing. But how can I get at what we're really doing? And technique is really, is really vital there. But then if I come over to the other side, the PhD, where I'm learning about Marcel Mauss, technique, but also habitus, Judith Butler, all of this kind of thing, Foucault, techniques of the self, technologies of the self, all this kind of thinking about what the body is, how is the body layered, sedimented, discipline, control, Saba Mahmoud, um, the kind of different ways of understanding the, 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 the layers, the flows of power in the body. This word technique is operating and it's meaningful in both places. And so it can be something that maybe um, there's a way to use it to uh, open something, a, a, a wider channel between these worlds. Okay, great. So you, you at the start of that, you, you talked about the mind-body duality or dichotomy. Now, I have talked to, um, my, I've, I've discussed this in lectures with students and in seminars, and it seems to really excite them. Um, a lot of them, uh, so on, on my, on the module, on the mind, on the body image, the mind-body module, on the body image module, a lot of them have proposed to begin their essays from interrogating this this binary i mean what what would how would you recommend people uh, my students your students um think about the mind in relation to the body yeah that's a great question and i've definitely been thinking that for i thinking about that for a long time um okay i mean what i really would say now is that um I don't, I don't think, I think the mind, for me, the mind is a little bit of a red herring. Um, I don't particularly focus on it. And this is another topic which we can get into and I don't want to make too many strong claims on it, but I don't, uh, I don't see in the cognitive approaches quite the, um, quite the importance and centrality that is often given to them uh, because they are about the mind. Uh, for me, the mind is kind of like, I'm not, I'm not sure what I would want to say about that. I think the body, if we bring it towards embodiment, which is different, mm -hmm. um, that's really important for me. It's really a central concept. Uh, and I, there, you know, I, my, my dear friend and colleague, Caroline Gatt, has just written a lovely piece in Body and Society, questioning the idea of embodiment. Uh, and we're in conversation also about this kind of area of theater making that I mentioned. Um, which is also mentioned in her article. And, and I think that's part of my thinking about embodiment. It's like, yeah, there are some real limitations that are cultural limitations about the idea of embodiment because it comes from the idea of the body, because it comes from this Western um, European mind-body split. So I'm not saying embodiment is kind of the answer or the permanent foundation. But I, for me, the question is, how do we think about embodiment? Uh, what are the ethics and the politics of embodiment? And then from that perspective, uh, I mean, to be honest, the, 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 the biggest effect that I've encountered in the last few years, the biggest change that I've encountered in my thinking in the last few years is because of the way that I've changed my thinking about what video is. And one of the reasons why that's been so significant is it's changed my understanding of what writing is. And part of what's happened is that I've come to think that a lot of what we mean by the mind is a, a bit of an artifact of the technology of writing, which isn't to say that uh, there isn't something else that we could call the mind if we didn't have writing. It doesn't mean that there's no such thing as consciousness. What I mean is when we separate the mind and the body, a lot of that is based on the ubiquity and not just the ubiquity, but the power, the logocentrism of the technology of writing. Uh, and when we talk, so, so when, we, when we talk about um, mind, intellect, uh, or, or explicit knowledge as opposed to implicit knowledge, or what is conscious. I'm just asking, I mean, I, I can't make a strong claim about this, but it seems to me that a lot of times 
actually the question we're asking is based on some assumptions about the technology of writing and how it works. And it, I'm, I'm in no way against the technology of writing. I'm a writer primarily in some ways, and that's very important to me. But when you, if you allow video to come into that picture, not as kind of like, oh, now we have video, great, that's nice, but really come into the picture and really say, okay, video also travels now, not quite in the way that writing does. It doesn't travel as easily. It's not, I mean, it's not as easy to work with video quite as writing, but we're starting to see in the last 10 years of the internet how video could have a kind of massive communication function the way writing does. And if you allow it to come into that position and say, well, video works very differently than writing. So that technology, if we treat video as a kind of thought, really, if we really say maybe that really is a kind of thought, then the whole idea of embodiment has to also change. Because the, if, if the mind body split, if we're thinking about the, the body from the perspective of the mind, but by the mind we actually mean writing, then when we think about video and writing as two technologies, then we're coming back to the body and saying, there, there was never a mind. That was, that was separate from the body. What there is is embodiment, which is life, which is in, inter, interacting and intersecting with all other bodies and inanimate things and objects and material flows and all of this is happening and we're, we're mixed into this. And there's in a way this kind of, I mean, there's, there's a lot of writing now about, heavy, how, about um, kind of following Latour and, and coming from other places as well, that the kind of ideas of networks and, and, and agencies, material agencies, everything having agency. So you can get to this kind of like, yes, okay. Uh, uh, it, it's almost uh, like uh, everything has agency. Everything is alive. Everything is moving. Everything is changing. There are no fixed categories. Yes, totally. That's obviously true. But then <laughs> if we're going to have some, that, that, that doesn't, the question is how does that, relate to conversations and conversations again i mean ways of thinking communication how does that relate to um structures of communication uh in that sense of the social not as the kind of uh, like a, uh, the social as something separate but the social as this layer of communication a historical thing mm -hmm. which is just no longer written it's no longer only written i mean writing still has a lot of power there are things that are still only written um, like constitutions, legal documents, uh, you know, you write down what are the, th but that's a technology, like how should we structure our society? Well, let's write it down. Okay, that's one way of doing it. Um, obviously there are ways of doing that without writing. Uh, I, who can imagine what it would look like to take video seriously in that way? So th that's kind of, the first thing I would do would, would be to say, it's not a binary, it was never a binary. Um, mind, we can, Decenter, we can refer to logocentrism as a lot of ways. In a lot of ways, let's relook at embodiment. Let's look again at embodiment, but let's also look at how we're looking at embodiment. So when we talk about it, when we, especially now, like if we're thinking about universities and teaching and classes, um, let's examine embodiment. But even in the word examine, do we just mean read about it and write about it? No. Uh, let's also practice. Okay, but then how do we share our practices? Well, we could write about them. Again, always coming back to writing, but there are other possibilities. So if we really take seriously like what it would mean to share that knowledge in video, to structure our practice in relation to video, that's a, it's a really active, I mean, I don't have answers to that, but it's a really active question for me. And not only video, but for me, video is really, because it's so powerful and it's so different from writing, but it's, it's having these circulations now. It has this power of kind of coming in and bumping out writing in a way and saying, well, what would it actually mean by, by intellect? What, you know, the idea of the intellect or the life of the mind, um, this way of, which has a lot to do with distance in a way, like you get distance from society or something, but, but that's also from the technology of writing that you would be able to close yourself in a room and do something which then goes out into the world. So if you do that with video, it's a completely different kind of distance uh, that you're taking or less distance or more or a different kind of distance. So it's just a, a way, I mean, I'm really interested in video. We can talk more about that, but I don't think that's the only thing that's happening there but displacing writing and then from that perspective, from this kind of uh, very complex sphere of network communication and technology in the context of an ecological crisis, then what is the body? What is embodiment? Mm -hmm. Comes a different question. Okay, so there's just so much in that, in that answer. So if I 
retrace some of that. Tell me if I'm wrong. So you're, so you're saying that the way we think about the mind and body, or the, the very proposal that there's a mind-body binary is an effect of the dominance of writing. It's an effect of that media technology. So that means that, for instance, we can say, this thing is, it's literally true that I'm sitting down. We use the word literally to mean physically, but literally means, it's literary, it's to do with the, the, the written, right? So we conflate, because of the history of writing and the status of, the, of words in, in our culture, we think our mind does that. We, we, we ignore the technology, the medium, and we think that there is mind that makes our body to do something. So we, we imagine a mind which is superior to a body. And you want to displace that onto, well, what happens when we don't live in a logocentric world anymore? So like, yes, there's still a place for writing in the world. Yes, our constitutions are still written, our laws are still written in words. But look at all of the other communication technologies that we exist in, one of which is video that you're really interested in. And video, again, has been regarded as something kind of trivial or less important than writing. So you're saying it's kind of de it's a very deconstructive operation, isn't it, where you take the supposedly secondary or supposedly inferior and go, no, 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 no. How can it be? In how is this pencil, which isn't in my hand, how, how is the keyboard, how is that somehow inferior to me when that is the technology that enables the communication, that enables the construction of a sense of meaning, of identity, and, and so on and so on and so on. So you take, so, so if you use a different technology, you don't have a mind-body distinction or it comes out in a different way. Um, so you think that, uh, another thing that you propose, I think in your book, towards the end of the book, which I, I didn't ask the students to read, um, and what one thing my students don't know, I guess, is that the Journal of Embodied Research is video essays. And your, your, one of the premises is that the new media technology, the new audiovisual technology, should enable it or should, be, should facilitate a completely different way of, of, of learning and of teaching and of capturing, archiving, studying. And you, you want to displace words. You don't want to get rid of them. We, no. need, we, need, we might need a name badge or we might need an arrow going, do, 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 do. That, you know, like we might need these maps and these pointers, but we shouldn't subordinate the audio visual and indeed the body, which can, which can manifest itself in new ways in the most, thanks to audio visual technology. Yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, um, there were a few things I wanted to pick up on there. Um, yeah, so what is the body? And, and, or what is thought, what, what would the mind be? Um, if we're talking about sharing audiovisual materials, um, I, think, yeah, I think you're absolutely, uh, I think that I do, I am saying that, that, that when, um, when we, when that very much, it's not just that we, we think of a mind and then when we write, we think that the mind is going there. I, I think I'm saying that causally, it's, it might even be the other way around where what we mean by mind is the stuff that can be written. Yeah, and okay. so what I'm, what I'm seeing with video, what I'm thinking about with video is, of course, video doesn't in some way give you embodiment. Uh, I mean, we could even easily list senses like smell and touch, uh, many kinesthetic senses, dynamics of force, which are crucial in martial arts and other fields, uh, which are very, uh, don't come through the video. I mean, in a very concrete way, the video, uh, and I'm thinking about audio visuality, is, it, it has a way of recording sound, um, and not all sound necessarily, but a big aspect of sound. Uh, it has a way of recording image, but moving image. Um, and I'm just saying this kind of as if in a way to alienate it, like it has a way of recording moving image. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> um, it, it can do that. Of course, it can't record all images, then it's not giving you necessarily two dimensions. And then of course, there's, there's technologies now where it's like, well, what if it is three dimensional? Or what if, uh, what if it's 360 degrees? Those are all interesting. But I'm actually really, because what I'm interested in is partly to do with the ubiquity and the accessibility of the technology. I think that Obviously, film has been around for more than 100 years, um, but the, the bulk of that time, the power dynamics and the economics of film, uh, not unlike the beginning of writing, um, it's accessible only to a certain very small number of people, and it requires a huge infrastructure 
um, in order to, so the conversation is just much narrower as with the beginning of printing the Bible, like you, you're just gonna get the Bible. Then later, uh, and you don't, you know, that it, there's a long distance between that, that moment of printing uh, and the kind of flow of printing that now defines, for example, the university. Mm -hmm. um, so if we think of video in that way, uh, we're not getting embodiment in this kind of, this, in the sense of life at all, but we're getting different, different mode of thinking, like, because here, here I am and I, you see my face, you see my movement, uh, you see what I'm wearing and you hear the tone of my voice. So also my words are not uh, in the way that they are as written words. They're in a very different way. Uh, and there are many things that you lose from the written word and other things that you gain. I mean, there's no, there's no desire to make a, a hierarchy. Um, but in terms of kind of structural hierarchy, thinking of the journal. Yeah, so the journal publishes video essays, which then they're peer reviewed, so they're video articles. Um, and the, for me, one of the crucial questions, the most important questions is what is the, the way, what are the ways, what are the techniques in which text and writing are integrated into the video and also words, uh, all kinds of words. So one thing that's interesting, okay, from each video article, we always make a transcript. And the transcript is there um, so that the, the writing technology, that the words can be searchable by search engines uh, and also accessibility tools that might read the texts out loud. Some things in the video are words and they can just be transcribed and other things are not and they would have to be described. Um, but the things that are words are both things that are printed. So if I put text on the screen, that easily transcribed. But also if I speak, some of the speech can be transcribed. That is the words, the, the aspect, you know, the, it's a very hard thing to shift the way of thinking about it, but I'm trying to go the other direction. The thing in my speech that can be transcribed is whatever you can transcribe. It's, it's the technology of writing coming back towards my, so some aspects of what's in the video can be transcribed and then the rest can't. And the, the question that's really fascinating for me at the moment is how, what are those different relationships between textuality and audiovisuality? So for example, voiceover has a, is very commonly used and in the, in the journal there's a lot of voiceover. You see the image of somebody doing something, practicing, exploring, moving, or you see other kinds of illustrations and someone is speaking about it. Sure, makes sense. Uh, but there are other possibilities as well. Text can be on screen, text can be scrolling, text can, uh, there can be long periods without text, without speech. How long can you go without any words, without any speech in the context of an academic article? Can you have an academic article, potentially, we don't have anything like this yet, where um, there's the only text is, let's say, the minimal text. So let's say we're, we're going to, because it's a journal, because the whole architecture of journal systems is based, of course, on text, there's going to be a title, there's going to be an author name or author names, an abstract and keywords. But what if that's it? Can there be then 20 minutes of audiovisuality where there's no words appearing? We don't have anything like that yet. I mean, so far, there's a lot of words, a lot of text. So there's no question of, of getting rid of text. But the text is not framing. Uh, and one of the things, one of the things that we've come to in the journal is that there's no text outside the video, uh, in the sense that you you're not allowed to. There's no scope for including a separate written statement, which people often ask, like, can I also include a written statement? Mm -hmm. And I say no, uh, but you can put the written statement in the video. So you know, if you want to read the, like, you can read a statement, you can have the text scroll, you can put text in the video, but the the video is the outer frame. So it's a kind of I think it's a kind of topology of knowledge or topology of rhetorics that, and that where I, I feel like I'm able to, act, to ask and play with and explore what text is and what, what kinds of knowledge and, and meaning we share through text because it's inside of this other kind of form which can hold a lot of text actually. I mean, right now we're sitting there, we're barely moving and it's just text, 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 text words, 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 but there's also more because you do see my hands moving, you hear my voice, there's a whole other dimension. But if we transcribe, I mean, you know, if we transcribe this conversation, you would get a lot of the conversation. Yeah. Yes, you wouldn't quite get the feeling of Paul and the feeling of Ben, but you would get a lot. Whereas if we were doing, if we were practicing martial arts together and you transcribed it, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get the same. So it's a kind of experimental space to think about these um, modes of communication. Yeah. So, the, so to translate that into a, um, I want to, I want to move the conversation along a little bit, but I think that the linking theme for me is 
you're interested in ways that different media, different technologies can capture something of, of, a, of a present or, or, or of a scene. Because when we, when we live in the present, in the present, that, that's a big theme throughout that book, isn't it? The idea of within, within the theatre and artistic and performance realms, people uh, fetishise the impossibility of capturing the artistic moment mm. and the artistic moment as something that is, you don't think this, other people have argued is by definition unique. And your argument is, no, it's not, it's not unique. It's just that you can't capture it because we haven't got the, and you, you're, you know, it's a, it's a product of a, a levels of training and different, so many factors that defy almost, they defy any one technology. So if we were immersed in technologies that could capture that could somehow really put us into that situation again, really capture it, it would be, it would be repeatable. So that's a big, there's a, there's a huge set of issues there that, and most of which, are comp probably all of which I completely um, agreed with you in the book, and I think it was completely fascinating and a little bit, definitely mind expanding to, to read your book when I, when I first did in 2015. But I want to move it on to something that, um, me and uh, Ben Judkins were dis discussing last week or the week before. So I had um, Ben Judkins here and uh, and here, <laughs> here, and um, we were discuss we were discussing aspects of your chapter on yoga, and I'm thinking about the notion of capture. So you argue in the book in the chapter on yoga that many physical practices today from all over the world whether that be yoga or martial arts or dance, have been forced into or appropriated by or captured by what you call a kind of athleticism, sort of a healthism paradigm. And healthism isn't, isn't health. It's not coextensive and completely encompassing of all possible definitions of health. Healthism is, is a paradigm that, that prioritizes the athletic, the youthful, the muscular, the, the lean, and you contrast that with, with, with a somatic paradigm, like you're just doing something for the feel of it, that's a different paradigm altogether. And Ben Judkins proposed that you would kind of were simplifying things and saying that was always the case. Now my response to him was, no, when I read the book, I thought you were talking about historical process, so that Western media culture today is dominated by this, what we might call an essentially simplistic, type of vanity and narcissism that's dominated by visual images of youthful athletic prowess whether that be big biceps or whether that be you know shiny skin or something um so have that process of capture has that always is that a western thing is the healthiest paradigm new is it western or is it or is that itself dominated by a technology the way that I have proposed or I've read and other people propose and I keep saying it you can connect the emergence of bodybuilding with the emergence of photography yeah. for instance so is it a what made healthism where did it come from what made that like is was it the technology was it the what was it do you think well then let me unpack a few things I mean first I want to say that I think that aspect of that chapter is probably, it, it, it's a little bit, in a way it's a little bit secondary to my, to my main argument. And so, and also it's not the kind of the main aspect that I've been focused on since then. So I don't feel quite, you know, I want to kind of hedge a little bit and say, uh, in terms of a large historical or political claim, um, especially historical, I'd probably defer to, to, to historians to some degree. Um, but I, I do have a few thoughts. I mean, I, first of all, I don't think healthism is, is just one thing. Uh, I think it's, I mean, for sure it's at least two things. Um, and they, they very much have to do with technologies. Um, because for sure there's a, so the main thing about healthism, I think that we could think about socially and politically is that it's individualist. Um, and, but there's at least two different ways of, 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 at least two different kinds of healthism, which are somehow related, but very different. And they're, they're very different technologies because you're referring to the healthism of how the body looks. 
Um, and that is, um, that is in some way bound up with photography in terms of its scale, for sure. Uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't many uh, kind of histories of um, the idea of health uh, that go far back beyond photography. And there are different histories of the body um, and different ideas of health. Uh, and in a sense, you could say probably there have always been grapplings with um, what does it mean to be healthy? Uh, you know, maybe these are kind of very broad transcultural categories. Well, what, what would it mean to be healthy? And, and if you're not healthy, what does that mean? So thinking about, for example, um, disability perspectives, um, there, there could be a kind of, uh, I don't want I mean, this is very complicated. I don't want to set it up too much as a progression, but let's say a symbolic paradigm where if you're unhealthy, that means you did something wrong. Uh, than a medical paradigm where if you're unhealthy, it doesn't mean you do something wrong, but it means something is wrong with you. And then we can try to fix that. Um, and a social paradigm where um, if you are not healthy, then the causes might be much more complex, much more dispersed, uh, and they might not only be about you. And it might not be you who's unhealthy, so deconstructing those things. That, I think there's complexities there as well. Um, there's, there's disabilities. That are that are not disabilities. You know, there's things that are classified as not healthy that are actually not not healthy. Uh, then there's other things like pain, uh, chronic pain, which are harder to kind of bring into a social model. So that's all very very complex. And I guess all I would want to so the main argument of the of that chapter, which is you know all I would really be able to kind of make strong claims about, is just we need to be opening up these questions. These are research questions, like what is health? Where, how do we understand health? Um, how do we cultivate health? Uh, how do we maybe de-individualize the cultivation of health? Um, because of these two dominant paradigms, so there's the kind of photographic uh, visual paradigm where you can, t as if you can tell if someone's healthy by looking at them, which today I think is probably most palpable in fat phobia and just a kind of feeling of like, oh, you, you know, if you, if you are fat, if you see someone who's fat, it's bad, it's unhealthy, et cetera. How can we fix it? It's an individual issue. Uh, it's a problem. Um, so that's a kind of visual, uh, as, if, as, if there, as if there's this visual possibility to kind of grasp this kind of idea of health and it's very important, uh, but, and also we, we, we understand it, we know what the problem is, we know, you know, all of this kind of, so it's very strict paradigm. But the, the medical paradigm is a little bit different because it's not particularly visual. So if you look, if you're thinking about like statistics, population statistics, um, mortality statistics, that's not the same as um, how people look. Those can be disaggregated, uh, but it's still a reduction. It's still a kind of simplification. Um, and that's not to, in a way, it's not to complain about the, the, the development of medicine or, the, or the, the, the power of medicine. I mean, there, there's no way to kind of criticize that on a certain level. And yet it can be implemented in very reductive ways and very harmful ways. Um, there's a book by Eli Clare on the idea of cure uh, and how the idea of cure can be a very violent idea. It, mm. it, you know, it intends to heal a problem, but it can also be extremely violent and that goes you know looking also back to Foucault history of madness and so uh so there's different I think healthism probably as a concept I would say it, it's about um reductive reductive systems of attempting to control health uh and how they can also do violence it doesn't mean that they don't also do good and I think it's a very complex complex question. So, you know, in some way, I, I don't feel able to dive into the question, but I feel like as someone who's thinking about embodied research, what I can say is it's complicated. And also it's not going to be answered only through statistical measurements uh, or kind of analysis of what's happening. Uh, it's also going to be answered in order to really grapple with that. You're going to also need to take a practice approach, an approach of practice and experimentation. And what we find in fields of embodied research, let's say, is um, actually health is one of the key ways in which you can instrumentalize and make your work measurable and receive funding. Uh, you know, I'm always talking about this kind of, well, uh, you know, if you're doing something that's the arts, you're in a certain section. If you can say that there are health benefits, 
you potentially have access to this um, massive structure. But I, I always feel a bit wary of it, right? It comes with a lot of strings attached because it has to be measurable in particular ways. Uh, it has to be evidenced in particular ways. It has to fit into certain paradigms. And among these is that, so those are both individualist paradigms though. They're both, in both cases, the question of health is, are you healthy as a person? Let me look at you, I got you, here's your body, I have it. You know, whether it's a medical analysis, I have it, or a photographic analysis, I have it. I got it, there it is, healthy or not. You know, more healthy, less healthy, that's the question. And um, that's not the only way we could think about health. And if we were thinking in terms of embodied practices uh, and various cultural practices that are not even associated with health, but are clearly, I mean, it's interesting how people are, uh, uh, there's often a study that will say like, look, we discovered that, for example, this one narrow kind of dance is good for you. It's good for your health uh, because we measured it. And when people did this dance, they were healthier and they were happier. And it's like, well, okay, yes, that's probably true. It uh, might be true of all dances. And you know what? It might be equally true of singing. Like you, you less often, you know, you, you hear people kind of fretting, for example, that they don't move enough. Um, but you don't have, people don't worry in the same way that they're not singing enough. Um, it's not, I don't think it actually, you know, I think to, to some degree we're, we're, we're just not seeing the picture of like practice and embodiment. <laughs> and like, yeah. You know, the, what, what is it that's actually healthy here? Isn't it kind of, um, yeah. we might figure it as play or community or interaction uh, or relations to earth, to the earth and to land. There's so much to say about that. I mean, there's some, some trivial, jokey, anecdotal things that I want to say and some bigger things. I'll, I'll chuck in a couple of trivial things. <laughs> My wife worries if she doesn't sing enough because she worries that it means she's sad, right? And, I, and, I, I, and, it, and it does. It basically it does, right? But it, and, and anyway, that's different. And the other thing is when I'm talking about measuring things, you know, you watch these programs about, they normally come on in January after New Year's Eve and everything. And, and it's like uh, scientifically, like, is this good for you? Which is better to do, like high reps or low reps? And, and it's, so they do these like eight week long tests and they go, well, the people who did a hundred reps put on just as much money as the people who did, as weight as the people who did 10 reps. And you're like, yeah, but, but your body responds to everything. If you haven't done it before and you do anything, you, it, it changes, the body changes in response to the, to the forces that, that it's subject to. Those are the very trivial things. More seriously, when you're describing the visual individualist, you say individualist, healthist paradigm, it was making me think of, of the kind of, you know, eugenic phrenology kind of approach. Like the, I've told the student, I talked with the students a bit about phrenology and the idea that the fantasy that you could measure and, and map the, the visual appearance of a body and then determine whether that person was going to be a criminal or, you know, they, they, so 19th century scientist in invert commas would be measuring you know bone structures of, of criminals and of Africans and of Asians and of the Irish and so on and so on and so on in order to try and type to, to, to develop types so I wonder if I'm, I'm, I'm leading up here to your arguments about de decolonial or decolonizing embodiment because it seems like although you say there's an individualism to it it seems to be perilously close to a kind of imposed simplistic universalistic kind of judgments like a hierarchy like this person has the right body image they are a good you know i'm thinking american psycho you know this is like you know you can always be thinner you can always do more crunches you can always do more press-ups and i'm wondering to what extent that relates to your recent arguments about decolonizing embodiment and the racial cultural class politics to the body and the, the images of the body? Yeah, yeah, thank you for asking that. Yeah, I mean, for sure, the technological um, and epistemological developments of these things are, uh, are deeply part of the history of racism and colonialism. Um, those measurements of the body, those classifications of the body, uh, yeah, I think that um, I think individualism is is um, is compatible uh, with in some way with the kind of universalism that you're referring to, uh, because it doesn't mean necessarily um, real individual autonomy. 
uh, or real individual health, whatever that might be. It means um, the individual as a, as a unit that can be measured, uh, for example, by establishing how healthy it is. Um, or how moral it is, or something like that, or how uh, even how human it is, um, and so the those those histories are the same in some way. I think I didn't really understand that to the same degree when I was writing um, what a body can do, and uh, I mean what a body can do is you know it, it structurally integrates um, thinking about gender. And that's because that's a much deeper kind of work in me. Uh, it mentions in that chapter also that um, it's possible to also think about race potentially and other identity categories, ethnicities and nationalities in that way. Um, but it doesn't kind of structurally integrate that and it doesn't go deep into it. I don't think it has a good handle on it. That's very much what I'm trying to, to think about these days. Um, and in a way since then, and it means grappling with the uh, the kind of whiteness of the um, of the institutions in which I'm also working, including like where I wrote the dissertation and where I published the the book and where I'm teaching now, uh, and the kind of the, this conception of academia and the way that, that knowledges are created there and the people who are there and the power structures um, in 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 order to think about okay technique. Um, I mean, it also, well, let me go back before that. It also means to think about the whiteness of the situations that were leading me to think about technique in this way. So making this bridge, when I said making a bridge between these different worlds, there's these different worlds which were in a way kind of modeling mind and body or theory and practice. Um, they were both predominantly white worlds uh, in New York City. And so they had certain kinds of limitations as well. Uh, and when I think about what those spaces of embodied practice are doing, I mean, a lot of those spaces of embodied practice um, have in the same period that I've been grappling in this way, have been, have been kind of grappling with their own whiteness, compelled to look at their whiteness and say, what are we doing here? And there's this navigation that's going on that has to do with rethinking what were the ethics and politics of working with the body in the first place? Um, what, like, what was this call to, what, like this, this idea that there's a kind of politics of, of embodiment or reclaiming of embodiment um, in, these, in these predominantly white spaces or, or all white spaces or very white spaces. I'm also thinking of the theater companies that I worked in before then, although it's different, but it's this very European, that's a European context of whiteness. Um, there's, there's, there's a lot of, knowledge that's coming from colonized contexts uh, and is deeply informing the ethics of the practice and the, the aims of the practice. So like the practices, I mean, like at the very beginning when I said, um, uh, when I said that the theater I was working in, there was drawing on yoga, there's drawing on martial arts, um, also a lot of drawing on various song traditions which are called folk song traditions, but in a lot of cases, they could also be called uh, indigenous song traditions. And so there's this huge um, flow of knowledge that's coming in, which is wrestling now, I think, with the, the, this, this, this very intense, important question of appropriation, uh, which gets flattened, I think, a lot in the public conversation around appropriation. Um, because of the extremely high stakes and the narrow uh, focus that it gets that gets put on it with these massive stakes on a very small example um, it's very hard to have that conversation but actually I think the conversation is about um, recognizing these flows of knowledge and saying uh, actually these other ways of thinking about embodiment or even other ways of thinking about health um, these are coming from actually other cultural contexts uh, which have been colonized which have been racialized, uh, which are still being colonized in various ways, still being marginalized, still being um, violently oppressed in many ways, uh, and, and, and subject to injustice as we're even seeing in the current pandemic very starkly, uh, more starkly even than before, which was already very stark. So 
I, I'm, I'm interested in thinking of it in terms of um, kind of obligation. Uh, I, don't, I don't have a good word for it yet. Is it obligation? Is it responsibility? Is it duty? But it's sort of like, a, as you come to see that um, there are these flows of knowledge, and, kind, and I don't just mean the theater companies, but also even the dance training that I did before that, uh, or just these kind of little places where things were appearing to me, which became this, um, this search for what I then called embodiment and became this kind of other idea of health uh, and became this idea of embodied research and became this kind of I hope for an ethics of audiovisuality. All of that does have links with kind of song traditions, movement traditions, uh, and those are precisely the things that are colonized to different degrees. I mean, even within Europe, there's the intra, there's colonization of European uh, indigenous traditions. And so that, that, those, those knowledges, like there's a lot of reclaiming of those knowledges, there's a huge desire to reclaim them, there's a desire to, and the, but there's all, it's so complicated because they can be reclaimed in a way that appropriates them, in a way that instrumentalizes them back into the kind of dominant paradigms of health, um, in a way that certainly doesn't change um, distribution of power. I mean, in the article that I think you're referring to uh, about notes, which is just notes for decolonizing embodiment, uh, I start the, the section on decolonization with um, Eve Tuck and K uh, Wayne K Yang's um, article, which is called Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, which is essentially when we talk about decolonization, we should be talking about land transfer to indigenous nations, basically. Um, and we shouldn't, be, we shouldn't be using decolonization as if it can mean social justice uh, or as if it could mean, uh, for example, gender politics divorced from a much larger politics of, decol of political decolonization. So for me, um, the question is about what is that relationship um, between decolonization in a political sense, which requires um, conversations between nations or sovereign sovereign things that that have control over land mm -hmm. um, and other forms of decolonization or decoloniality where where we're talking about what we understand as our body as our embodiment so how we understand uh, our bodies and our beings our living our, our living beingness um, in flows of race and flows of gender and flows as well as of class and nation and these different language, these different things that, that configure. How do these, th I mean, these things intersect in us and they place us in these power structures, but we also work with them and all of the flows of communication around them are not simply reenactments of power structures. They're, they're struggles, they're constant struggles. Um, so I, I think this is the path that I'm going on. I mean, I, I think for me, technique is still an important idea in thinking about all that because it still for me gets at something about it. Somehow it's getting cutting through some of the, not just mind body, but also like structure and agency, um, material and cultural, like, yeah, what, what, what matters actually is ways of doing things, pathways that are to some degree repeatable and shareable. And that does mean technologies, but it doesn't only mean technologies because there's no technologies without living bodies. So it also means ways that we are ourselves. And there's, you know, that intersects with so many areas of thought and culture. So it's still a really useful perspective for me, but I don't, I think I don't anymore, in what a body can do, I was really trying to isolate technique in a way. And in my, in my recent work, uh, and this has to do with the role of video, I've been thinking about the relations of technique, identity, and place. Uh, that is, those terms are informed by readings in critical race theory, critical race studies, indigenous theory, indigenous politics about place and identity, um, but, but also linking to technique because I, we're not only place and we're not only identity, but we're also not only technique. We're not only kind of what we consciously cultivate. We are interweaving these things and those, are, those things are in a way different levels or Deleuze would say different speeds uh, of, 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 of things. Um, so that's kind of where I'm currently thinking is putting technique in relation to identity and place and seeing how technique is of place and technique constructs identity, but also arises out of identity. Um, and I think the, so the ethics and politics of technique then can't really be about isolating technique. I mean, I think I was still at that time writing what a body can do still very much in what I'm, I'm thinking now is this kind of, um, it's almost like what I'm starting to think about it as almost like a critical whiteness studies that doesn't know that it's a critical whiteness studies, 
um, that's actually like these practices that I'm referring to are in fact trying to decolonize themselves, but without an awareness of the political landscape, often without an awareness, like they, they're not intending, they're not intentionally colonial actions. It's not like I'm going to go take your song and then you won't have it. It's just the opposite, actually. It's like, let me take your song and your song will live and that will also mutually support you. So it's not, it's not a colonial action in that way, but it's cut off from a politics. So it's also not like, I'm, I'm, may I have your song and let's be in solidarity. It's not that either. It's like, it's about the song, which is, which is beautiful. Um, so it's about the technique. But um, I think now for me, it's kind of like, okay, those, those ties need to be remade. And technique can be a, a starting point for remaking those ties and saying these techniques link us at the level of identity and then beyond that, at the level of place um, where we are and where we've been and where we come from. And if we can connect those threads, maybe we, we, we have a, some kind of understanding of, of kind of what we're doing, but, but in context. Okay, That's, that was an incredibly expansive um, answer and I, when you were when you began talking about that I, I was going to pose a question but you actually answered it completely fully in the process of um of not not answer, not of me not having imposed it yet because i was thinking about the so from the idea of colonizing things being colonized and things being decolonized i was thinking of the way in which certain movements and certain kind of body postures and body transitions and so on are connected with power and class so i mean the first thing that popped into my head was oh so it, the the early ninth the early 20th century uh, british english martial art of bartitsu was very gentlemanly martial art it was about like how how Victorian gentlemen could defend themselves against thugs and hooligans and the Irish and and and, and the colonial subjects that they were meant to be uh, in charge of, and it's a, it's the Sherlock Holmes martial art. It's the it, that's that's the martial art, and it's very very elegant. And you, you behave like a gentleman, even though you're fighting. You fight in an elegant way, and that led me to thinking about gender and the performance of gender, so the, the way a man walks, the way an arrogant man walks, or a bit, and I was thinking, is it possible to take one of those, each, any technique, or that technique of posture, that technique of movement, or of using your voice, which might be associated with masculinity, or upper class, or superior something is it possible to decolonize that but then you went on to answer it by saying that you really need to kind of triangulate it's not just about the 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 technique it's about the technique in a place who is commanding it and whether that command is subverting or enriching or strengthening a kind of uh, of a hierarchy the other th i was thinking of two other things one was a student was just asking me about james bond and wants to do a kind of semiotic analysis of the performance of masculinity in James Bond. And I was wondering whether, you know, you could ironically, the way that Judith Butler would once talk about like, like parodic performance of that, whether that would somehow subvert or transform either masculinity away from its older forms to different forms of, of performance. It's an incredibly complicated thing. And I'm looking at the clock. So, I mean, um, you know, so you're now arguing that you, you can't take one thing like technique. It has to be triangulated, has to be given a place, has to be thinking about th in terms of a position or maybe a hierarchy or a, maybe what Stuart Hall would have called conjunctural analysis. You have to, well, this is about capture again, isn't it? You can't just take the one thing, technique, the written word, the audiovisual. You have to try and do a conjunctural analysis of where the technique is being deployed practiced, expanded? Well, something that's interesting about video, more than interesting, something that's been <coughs> really, um, again, going back to how thinking about video as thought has changed my understanding, um, is that you, you can't have the technique in video by itself. I mean, I guess you could have a drawing of it, but when you make a video of someone demonstrating a technique, their identity and the place is also present. You might not be able to identify it. To know, I mean, you might see the place and not know where it is, but it, it has this concreteness um, 
where it's and it's quite often it is so watching video like of someone's practice you, you you can see their identity in some ways and you can see their place in some way and it just it just it's so different than writing again um you know the way that that words kind of can float around and be be so detached uh and then in writing uh you know there's a movement that's related to i think i don't know if it kind of is first in feminism but it's a very important feminist theory movement that's now also much more widespread where you you try to put in words who you are as part of the argument so you know before you make your argument you say uh as you know i speak from this position you situate yourself you position yourself and that's part of the argument but of course you have to do that in words and it's it's just a it's a different thing you're present in a different way in video um, yeah. So, and, but I'm not. I'm not saying that you can't only focus on technique. I mean, I think it's, you know, the, the what a body can do was about the fact that technique is fields and it's fields of knowledge. And so, when you work in songs, when you work with with movements, with areas of movement and, and, and practice, you can dwell in them very, very deeply. Um, they, they, there is stuff there. There's a whole world inside of uh, something like breath or balance or or or, or pitch, uh, melody. Um, so one, one can dwell in those things. And I think there's, that's really important. Um, I think part of why it's important is because of the relations that those dwellings have with the people who are dwell, who are doing that dwelling and the, the, the communities that support that dwelling, because that, that, that possibility of dwelling in song or dwelling in movement is always supported by a community of practice. And that community has, is, is supported by a place or, or land. And so it's not that you can't go into that. It's almost like, um, it's almost, I mean, I, for me, I would almost say it's a, it's a joy and it's a pleasure. And it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a culmination of, of, of aliveness. I mean, I'm, now I'm reading um, uh, Hassonen's book on sex as play. And there's also like, it's, another, you know, it's just another kind of extraordinary culmination and, and joyfulness and enjoyment of, of life to dwell in embodied practices. Um, but what I'm wondering is if there is, is how do we figure the obligation and the duty and the responsibility that comes along with that dwelling through the layers of communities of practice and other communities and, and lands and places and, and all these infrastructures that allow for that dwelling. Okay. Well, I think that the, the one question we're left with at the end of this, um, this lesson, this discussion is what haven't we discussed? I mean, we've discussed everything. So I think I'm just going to say, um, Ben Spatz, thank you very much. Um, that was absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.